Today, uh, Martin Dewey, a great colleague of mine uh, from another field of study, but very much interested in this area, uh, how to connect teachers, actually. Our duty is to connect teachers to English as a lingua franca, something similar to what Robert said in the previous plenary. We are, in fact, into the uh, you know, uh, English use, English language use, how intercultural English language use is in fact uh, activated in lingua franca situations. And he a couple of times mentioned this uh, during his talk. Now we will be talking about, talk. we will be listening to an expert who is in fact from English as a lingua franca field. But as I said, uh, he's, today he's going to talk about how, what the implications of this digital era be, will be on elf and teacher education. Uh, Martin Dewey uh, from King's College London, who is a reader in applied linguistics, will be with us today. And his research is, as I said, mainly focuses on globalization of English and role of English as a lingua franca. And his research primarily entails exploring the relevance of English as a lingua franca in language teacher education and the impact this has on how we conceptualize language and language knowledge in English language teaching. His research interests also include focus on multilingualism, language attitudes and ideologies and critical pedagogy in teacher education. He has presented and published widely on this, uh, on this, on this topic and uh, related topics throughout his years. And he has been uh, author and co-author of many uh, publications, including edited volumes um, and uh, journal articles. And one important thing about Martin is, I want to mention here, which is not written here, written in his bio is, he's also interested in connecting, working from an interdisciplinary perspective uh, within his area of uh, research. So that's something very interesting. So today he will be talking out of this uh, uh, window uh, and present us his topic on health and teacher education in a digital era. So the floor is yours, Martin. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> okay, so I should just, just, just uh, reiterate that my expertise in, uh, in research um, and in pedagogy is really much more focused on English as a lingua franca and the impact of globalization on English. Um, than it is on digital technology. But central to the study of English as a lingua franca has always been digital technology. This is what has facilitated the untethering of English from its sort of geographic and cultural roots. So I've very much been interested in digital technologies in education in the periphery, at least until March 2020, when my world changed because of the pandemic. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about, I'm going to do both, I'm going to talk about English as a lingua franca research and about how I've tried to adapt my own teaching in response to the global pandemic, but also I will be presenting some recent research that I've conducted with some teacher educators in London who talk about their own experiences of trying to implement a, a sort of teacher education through remote digital technologies. So that's really the focus of of my talk. Um, the, now the, let me move that again. So to begin with, what I'd like to do is give, give you a, a, um, a timeline, a brief timeline um, of how I became aware of the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's influenced my life. So, it, it, so my, I first became aware of it probably not on the 31st of December, 2019, which was when the World Health Organization started picking up on um, announcements made in Wuhan in Hubei province, China. The, I first heard about it in early January, but what's notable is until the 20th of January, the first, the first internal communication from King's College London um, of the year, in an address by the executive dean of faculty, there was no reference on the 20th of January to the coronavirus and the messages from the executive dean and from the health and safety report from the, from the School of Education uh, that I, in which I work, the message was all about a ha having a happy new year and, and looking forward to facing the challenges of 2020. And there was no appearance or no reference to coronavirus in that first address. 
the first communication regarding the coronavirus was on at, at King's College London was the 29th of January. Um, and this was really um, specifically relating to travel to and from Hubei province and mainland China more generally, where the, the, the original outbreak occurred in Wuhan city. So the, it was still very much a, a, a story that didn't involve me, that didn't impact on my research or on my teaching. The, but this really dramatically changed over the coming weeks, as uh, you will all uh, have experienced as well. So the, the first communication in which coronavirus was mentioned as an email subject was on the 31st of January, 2020. Um, and this was about, this was addressed to students who were studying at King's at the time and originated from, had traveled from Hubei province that year. Um, then, so it's very specifically about students from, from Hubei province. The, then we begin to get college-wide communication. So the first college-wide internal communication was on the 6th of February, 2020. And then it all really escalated soon after that. So we got regular updates, but from the 11th of March onwards, so between the 11th of March and the 16th of March, so over a five day period, everything changed very, very dramatically. And the changes that were being implemented had to accelerate to keep up with what was what the developments that were happening at the time. So the, and I mean, the, the date of the 11th of March is significant because this is when the World Health organization um, classified the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, as a global pandemic. All right? by, so by the 16th of March, face-to-face -face teaching had been suspended at King's and plans th that were being developed to move towards more remote learning had to be accelerated very quickly. In the UK, on the 20th of March, all schools closed. And then on the 23rd of March, the country went into a national lockdown. Now, in those first, I just, I've, I've, we won't dwell on them, but I've got, um, I've, I've taken sort of the key messages from those internal communications. So you can see from the first one on the 20th of January, the tone is very much welcoming everyone back to the new term and the new year. As I say, no mention of coronavirus whatsoever. Then the first mention of the coronavirus outbreak is in relation to. Uh, travel to and from Hubei province and mainland China more generally, which at that time didn't include travel to Hong Kong or Macau. Okay, that was from a health and safety report. The, the 6th of February is when we get the first specific mention of the coronavirus outbreak in an email uh, title. So the heading of the email mentions coronavirus. And then you see it very quickly escalating as levels of un uncertainty begin to increase from the 11th of March onwards. And the change is very, very rapid from this announcement where the message is under, about understanding how the global spread of COVID-19, now it begins to be described as COVID-19, how the uncertainty of it is beginning to increase to then one of, you know, we nearly, re we really need to implement change very quickly. So there were, there were announcements like this um, on the 13th of March, the announcement was that that teaching would be, would move online from the 23rd of March. So you can see teaching week beginning Monday the 16th of March will be the last week of classroom and lecture based teaching. In fact, it turned out that the 16th of March ended up being the very last day that online teaching took place um, because the, the situation was changing so dramatically. And then the final announcement um, that I've got here. This obviously we, we continue to have announcements about COVID nineteen all of the time. It's a weekly, it's a weekly update now. Um, and here you've got advice to students and staff that was issued on the sixteenth of March. Um, so I, I mean, I was in Kings in London on the sixteenth of March, intending, expecting to return to my office the very next day, the seventeenth of March, to actually do some teaching. But things changed overnight, and I didn't return to my office from the 16th of March again until the end of September, 2020. So it was, it was I mean, the reason I'm, I'm talking about this communication is to really illustrate how quickly things changed and how quickly everybody needed to adapt.
okay? Um, it was a, a shock to all of us and the, the modifications we had to make to our pedagogic practices were substantial. The, now, leading up to this point, leading up to March 2020, my research, as uh, Yasmin was saying in the introduction, was to consider, this is the focus of my work had been for some time, uh, to consider the pedagogic impact of the emergence of English as a lingua franca. And in relation to the impact of the global pandemic, what's really important, I think, to highlight here is that English as a lingua franca has been described, for example, by Barbara Seidelhofer, one of the key researchers in this field, as um, an extra territorial lingua franca. In other words, it's not connected physically to a particular location or a particular uh, setting geographically or culturally. And this is a really important way in which the coronavirus, the COVID pandemic has continued to have an impact on the way I think about teaching and the way I think about English, because um, it's, as I said before, it's central to the research of English as a lingua franca, have always been the role of digital technologies and their increasing impact on our lives, including the impact they have on how we interact with each other. So the focus of my work has entailed trying to develop a, and promote among teachers critical reflection so that teachers will be enabled to examine shared practices in language pedagogy um, in a, from a questioning, in a sort of questioning light, okay? In other words, we, we encourage teachers to think differently about what they do in the language classroom as a result of English being a globalized language and extraterritorial lingua franca. This entails revisiting concepts of language competence and teacher knowledge so that we can think differently about what it means to be competent in English. Um, and it also entails uncovering the extent to which approaches to language continue to be oriented towards linguistic convention and a target language norm. Despite growing awareness of English as a lingua franca, we continue in English language teaching a lot of the time to design materials and set learning goals that are oriented around a fairly fixed native speaker, sometimes quite idealized, model of English. Um, and so, so a lot of my work has been uncovering that and um, trying to critique it. An important aspect of this entails also acknowledging linguistic and cultural diversity and looking really at how we interact in multilingual settings and how that is different from conventional characterizations of English and conventional conceptualizations of um, competence and knowledge about language. The, so so a, a good deal of my work has involved exposing teachers during teacher education and also exposing teacher educators to the emergent properties of language. So promoting systematic reflection on existing linguistic and methodological norms in English language teaching so that teachers might explore a more dynamic and, and less static version of uh, language and communication. The, just as a, a, a summary, quick summary, all right, what ELF research, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell too much on the, the properties of English as a lingua franca research, just want to summarize it before then moving on to talk about um, teacher education in response to COVID-19. So the, what we found out from ELF research is that native speaker English norms are in fact not optimal for interaction in multilingual settings. Native English speakers, because they are very often monolingual, they are not ideal models of effective multilingual communication or effective intercultural or transcultural interaction. Intelligibility issues where they are identified in ELF research are often found to occur with the presence of native English speakers in transcultural interaction. So speakers, if you're a native speaker of English, you are more likely to be monolingual than bilingual or multilingual. And so therefore you're not necessarily going to have developed the same kind of cultural sensitivity and awareness in order needed to be able to communicate effectively in a multilingual environment. 
English, um, another find, key finding of ELF research is that English communication and the use of English are most often effective when speakers are willing to modify their language patterns. So adapt the way they speak to fit the, their, in, their, their, their immediate environment and communicative purposes. So we can reframe non-native English speaking proficiency and characterize this not by contrasting it with native speaker proficiency, but by thinking about the importance of accommodation strategies and other listener oriented communicative strategies, the development of transcultural awareness, being able to adapt language resources and engaging in code switching or, or translanguaging. I haven't got time to go into that now, but presumably everybody will have heard these, these terms before and be uh, more or less familiar with them. The, these, what these findings have done is present quite uh, substantial challenges to conventional beliefs and practices in English language teaching. So because, and again, something worth, worth illustrating here is that what ELF research has highlighted is the fluidity with it, through which interaction takes place in multilingual settings. So very often the communicative or interactive uh, setting is an evolving one. It's tran it, 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 English as a lingua franca communication takes place it, often in very transitory contexts that are marked by a high degree of language diversity and cultural diversity, which results in very variable and, and what I've said before, adaptive expression of linguistic resources. The, this represents a challenge because it's quite different. What we found in ELF research is what counts as effective communication is often very, very different from conventional um, descriptions of, as I said before, language uh, competence and knowledge about language among teachers. So traditionally, grammar is widely seen as a precondition for communication. If you want to communicate effectively, you have to learn how to use the grammar correctly. In other words, intelligibility is seen as norm dependent. Yeah? But as I've already uh, made clear, I hope that from ELF research findings, we can see that effective communication is not achieved simply by conforming to fixed sets of norms. Sometimes effective communication is achieved by contravening those norms, by using language very fluidly and adaptively, not by adhering to uh, a set of norms. So unfortunately in English language teaching, traditionally the teaching is predominantly norm driven because we have tended to see intelligibility as norm dependent. The, but this is a very narrow definition of competence. Yeah? Um, teaching is very often assessment focused as a result, but we, we can move beyond that. And there's, there's been quite a lot of work that has um, addressed this issue and tried to develop ways of thinking about the assessment of language proficiency differently. For example, uh, Jennifer Jenkins and Constant Lung have written about this uh, in 2018 in a very radical suggestion for the way we approach assessing English language uh, proficiency. And then also Tim McNamara has written quite a lot about this in relation to English as a lingua franca. A key aspect of my research specifically has been looking at teacher beliefs with regard to how teachers conceptualize proficiency in English and knowledge about language as a language teacher. And here I've got a, just a very, just a couple of um, examples of the kinds of things that teachers say when asked to define what they think good, inverted commas, good, good English is. And this is from an article that I, I wrote together with in Magulada Pineda um, that is in a special issue of the English Language Teaching Journal that I co-edited with Yasmin. Okay, so you've got here what we've seen in this research when we're talking to teachers about the way they conceptualise English is that the field is going through a period of transition. We're transitioning from the left-hand column, which is this normative perspective on language. So teachers, there are quite a lot of teachers that um, still think about effective English use in relation to native speaker norms and correctness, um, what is grammatically correct, okay? And we're, but we're transitioning away from that, I think, towards 
what we describe in the article as an elf compatible version or an elf compatible understanding of language proficiency and knowledge about language. And so the, you, you have the, the comments on the right, in the right hand column, are uh, teachers who adopt a more, if you like, progressive uh, view on English language proficiency. And here the focus is more on being successful in communication, being intelligible, right? being understood. Okay. So that's that's really a, a, a summary of some of the recent findings that I've, I've uh, looked at in my um, in my work, the most salient themes that I've identified are that teachers have quite a com can have quite a complex relationship with English, and they identify with it in different ways. Teachers are very keen to critically re-examine shared practices in language pedagogy. When asked to do so, they are they tend to be very keen to reflect critically on their beliefs about language um, in relation to proficiency and knowledge about language as a teacher, um, and also happy to question some of the pedagogic assumptions that they may have made in the past. But what also has come out of my research is that an understanding that to promote awareness of linguistic diversity is can be difficult. It's, it, it's, it's doable, it's something we can achieve. We can encourage teachers to move beyond thinking about language in relation to correctness and native speaker standardized norms. But change in belief and attitude does not always lead to change in pedagogic practice. It's really, really challenging. And so something that I've, I've realized over the past uh, few years is that it's essential that we involve teachers in action-based classroom research if we want to bring about curriculum development and pedagogic change in response to globalization, in response to the emerging findings in English as a lingua franca, and in response to what's happening um, as a result of digital technologies. Okay, so I'm going to move on from that and leave aside for the moment the research I've done in relation to English as a lingua franca and talk about research I've done since March 2020 when my world and everyone else's world changed. Um, I've recently been collecting data from uh, four very experienced teachers and teacher educators working in London. They have, at, um, as a minimum, 18 years experience in English language teaching. One of the teachers, 25 years, um, and ranging from 12 to 20 years experience in teacher education. Two of the participants are also currently teaching fellows at King's College London. So they are, they are teaching fellows who teach on some of our MA and BA programmes to provide a focus on language teaching practices. Um, so they don't, they don't have academic roles in the university. They, are, they also work in other institutions, but their focus is bringing sort of theory and practice together um, in the classroom for students enrolled on degree programmes at King's College London. So they bring a lot of practice oriented expertise, uh, whereas the academics at King's provide more of a, a, a theoretical input, if you like. Um, the, so I've, I've been talking to via email and um, through uh, interview, um, talking about these teachers and educators experience of implementing teacher training courses online because I wanted to understand how they have uh, adapted to English, to the developments that have happened, that we've had, we've all had to make over the past uh, nearly two years now. Okay, so my, my research focus was really around these questions. So these were the, the initial questions that I identified um, that I thought I would really want to, to ask these teachers and teacher educators about. So the first is to understand how teacher educators have had needed to modify their approach to the supervision of teaching. So I was interested in how observation of classroom teaching has happened online. So when conducting teaching practice remotely, how do teachers modify or how do teacher trainers modify their practices? Um, what are the main challenges teachers face when preparing for and conducting observed teaching remotely online? So looking at 
what is it that diff teachers find most difficult? Then I was interested in asking whether or not there were they, these teachers saw any key differences between novice and experienced teachers and the way they responded to online teaching practice. So the some of the courses were initial teacher education courses. So they were with novice teachers who had very little or no prior um, formal training or experience. Other courses were for designed for experienced teachers. I was interested in, in seeing whether or not teachers were responding differently, depending on whether they were novice teachers or experienced teachers, um, with, responded differently to this move towards more remote online um, interaction for teacher education. The, I also was interested to see whether there were any advantages, both from a teacher, student teacher perspective, and from a supervisor or observer perspective, in conducting observation and feedback remotely. And then as a follow on from that, I also wanted to know whether any of the teacher educators felt that the changes they were making to their practices as uh, through during their supervision of teaching practice would then continue to be adopted in the future. Um, once we get back to a more normal, if, if we do get back to a more normal uh, state of affairs. And I, th the reason I was asking this question is because I, I've noticed in my, and I, I've mentioned this in, in my abstract, I've noticed in my own pedagogy that changes that I've made to the way, that, the way I approach teaching and interaction with students um, as a, in response to COVID and needing to work remotely, I uh, have influenced the way I interact face to face and they've influenced the way I conduct my teaching now. Um, uh, even though we've gone back to some face to face teaching at uh, King's. Okay. So in response to the first question, what ex to what extent have you had to modify your approach to the supervision of teaching? The, there were some some positives, some negatives. These are some of the things that uh, the teachers or the trainers said in response to this question, that it was a challenge, but essentially what was really important they felt was to keep the same dialogic approach. So interaction was important. So there was some fear initially that moving away from face-to-face -face interaction and going online would reduce the extent to which you could adopt a dialogic approach but then um, that didn't necessarily um, that didn't necessarily end up being a problem the of course everyone um, mentioned the challenges of using technology and needing to rethink the way input was provided on teacher training courses especially in relation to having to demonstrate a particular procedure or technique and one teacher in particular, one trainer in particular, was very interested in what he calls orthodoxies. Um, so he, he, he was saying how some of the orthodoxies that we promote on CELTA, CELTA is the certificate, this is the Cambridge Teaching Award certificate in um, English language teaching. It's a pre-service, very often intensive uh, teaching qualification. And it, it, I mean, it's very popular in the UK, but it also has an influence worldwide. Probably uh, many of you will have heard of it. So what one tutor was saying in particular was what they see as an orthodox approach when, when um, teacher training face-to-face -face simply doesn't work online, that they have to develop new techniques in order to be able to provide the same kind of, um, of input and support to, to student teachers. The Another key point, the last bullet point there that I think is really important to highlight is that um, everyone, all four of the teacher trainers that I've been speaking to about this said that it's really difficult to promote and sustain learner engagement. So that's difficult for the tutor with student teachers, and it's very difficult to develop that skill in the uh, student teachers themselves when they're, when they're trying to conduct their own teaching practice classes um, online. Okay. The, in response to question two, what are the main challenges? 
a lot of this was about um, how to use the, te- oh, sorry, you've got a typo there. Understanding how to, use, of course, understanding how to use the technology, the tech, um, for example, using Google Docs and, and giving editing rights so that people could share a, a Google Doc, um, trying out new software or new tools such as Padlet during a, a classroom um, observation or teaching session. There was a lot of, a lot of, reference to feelings of exhaustion feeling fatigued because it t- because working face to face um is much easier in relation to uh, being dynamic and make, sustaining energy levels there, every, all, all four of the tutors that i've spoken to have said that it was a real challenge trying to maintain interest and engagement and that was very very tiring Um, that it it takes a lot out of everyone, the tutors and the student teachers and the practice students during the teaching practice sessions. Um, And and one of the tutors says, everyone now seems a bit jaded with online learning and teaching, which is a shame. Uh, I think we will recover from that as we get back to a more hybrid uh, approach. The, in response to question three, this was the one that, that asked tutors whether they felt there was any difference between novice and experienced teachers. Um, One teacher in particular, Mel, said that when training novice and experienced teachers online, there are minor differences if both groups are new to the platform and online teaching. What she did find though was that experienced teachers, if anything, it was more of a challenge for experienced teachers, that they struggled because they felt they couldn't do the things they were used to doing easily or that they were used to doing effectively in the classroom. She described this as a psychological struggle. Um, And and a couple of the tutors said the same thing, Um, that it was very difficult for experienced teachers to display their expertise, to show the the observer what they could do, because it was all all very new to them. Um, The... Okay. The uh, In response to question four, are there any advantages for the teachers or observers in conducting observation and feedback? There, I was surprised, but, but there was quite a lot of, of, of positivity, about, positivity about some of the advantages that, that um, doing teacher training remotely um, gave, uh, gave rise to. So for a start, uh, we've all experienced this. We've had vastly reduced commuting times. We don't travel. Um, from home to work anymore. Um, And so this frees you up to do things from your own home, uh, which makes for a lot of tutors made um, taking part uh, in part-time teaching um, and teacher training more attractive because the sessions are in the evening, you don't have to travel late. Um, One one challenge was that it was, again, and this relates to the point before about fatigue, because attention levels are so difficult to sustain online. We've all experienced it. If you're, if, you're, if you're spending an hour after hour, day after day, interacting through this kind of format, it is very, very tiring because you, you have to pay attention very carefully. It's difficult to listen. You have to listen closely. An advantage is that you feel anonymous. If you're observing a teacher, you can switch off your camera. So your presence as an observer becomes reduced so that the problem of the observer's paradox is is partially overcome by the anonymity, the relative anonymity that um, working remotely can provide. um, It allows teacher trainers to take notes much more discreetly. So if you're observing, and this is something I've been very interested in because I'm also now having to do classroom observation remotely for research purposes. I'm, I'm collecting data, it's part of a research project where I need to observe teachers. And in a physical classroom, as an observer, your presence is, is uh, very often really, really noticed by the teacher and the students. So, it's, and I, I'm very aware, very conscious as an observer that as soon as I, I start taking notes, I see something interesting, I start taking notes. I think the teacher becomes very aware of that. So you can take notes discreetly without the teacher necessarily realizing that you're taking notes. But a downside is it can be very difficult to see what a teacher is doing. They, um, it excludes their physical presence. So you can't necessarily observe what it is the teacher's doing and how they're doing it effectively or not. You 
One advantage though is you have time to consider feedback, FB's feedback, feedback before delivering it. So it gives, it promotes greater reflection. And we'll see that in, um, in some of the interview extracts that I'm going to show to you in a moment. The final question, do you think there are any changes you've made to your practices? And this is, as I say, one that I was particularly interested in because I'd noticed how my own, um, my own work had, had changed even once we'd gone back to some face-to-face -face interaction. The one tutor said that I found it hard to keep people calm online during the pandemic, that there was a lot of anxiety and that the tutor as a result had become more ex accepting of things that go wrong in a, an observed teaching practice session, um, which the, the tutor said was especially true with technology because everybody was having the same kinds of struggles and the same kinds of challenges when using technology, the observers became more understanding and sympathetic. Okay, the um, multimedia options in class are going to be used more by some of the tutors. Several people mentioned this, that, um, that we've learned as we've learned how to use these technologies because we were forced to do it, then um, there are lots of some of those advantages uh, we can, can we can continue to take forward even if we are working face to face. Okay. And I think that, that the last point here is is a really really interesting one. That um, the tutor says that she can appreciate the difference in both contexts, so face to face and online much more having had to do it himself, herself. That, um, and this, this was a, another common theme that the tutors felt that they were discovering how to use the technology, how to teach remotely, how to interact online um, in an educational setting in the same way that the student teachers were. So it was a, a shared collaborative experience and 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 that comes out in quite a lot of the quite a lot of the um interview data that i've got the i want to mention briefly the flipped classroom it was mentioned already this morning um the i'm going to show some interview data shortly but um just very quickly wanted to mention flipped learning or the flipped classroom because uh two of the teachers talk about this and how they've adopted a more flipped approach um, this is from a study of student perceptions of the flipped classroom. It's a dissertation at the University of British Columbia. And the definite, I think the definition there is quite a straightforward one, is an instructional strategy. So the flipped classroom is an instructional strategy that can provide educators with a way of minimising the amount of direct instruction in their teaching practice while maximising interaction. The author has said maximising one-to-one interaction. I've put square brackets around that because I don't think it necessarily is about maximizing one to one interaction, it's about maximizing interaction. Okay. Um, an important point also is that the strategy leverages technology providing additional supporting instructional material for students that can be accessed online. So that, that's obviously a key component of the flipped classroom. In particular, in relation to the flipped classroom in teacher education. There's a very interesting article written, in fact, by one of the tutors in of one of the four tutors I've been working with in this, this uh, study um, called Flip, Flipping Training, in which she talks about adopting a flipped approach to a pre-service initial teacher training qualification, the CELTA course. Um, and what she talked about was taking away the input sessions altogether. So the idea, this is a quote, this is, I'm quoting here from her article. So the point that she was making is that in a conventional initial teacher training course, we have a lot of direct input where the teacher, tra the role of the teacher trainer is to provide um, sort of demonstrations and models and a, an account of theories of uh, language teaching methodologies. Um, in a very prescriptive way. So there was a prescribed timetable. But the point that she's making is that the prescribed, the nature of a prescribed timetable means that trainee teachers, student teachers, may not have received the required input in time for a teaching practice lesson that they're going to give. Okay. Um, and, and the course hours were taken up so much with the input 
that a lot of the lesson preparation the teachers, the student teachers were needing to do was done at home on their own, which she describes as odd because what we're doing is we're asking student teachers to analyze the language they're going to introduce in a lesson, to evaluate the course book materials they want to use, create their lessons, develop their lesson plan. Um, in other words, it, use these higher order thinking skills outside of the course hours. In other words, when the tutor was not available to provide support and scaffolding, which is why uh, she has developed this flipped approach to teacher training. Okay, um, which looks like this. Um, this is, a, this is a, a figure that she presents in the article. So rather than have an input session where the tutor talks about a, a particular theory or a particular methodology, two days before the student teacher gives the teaching practice session, the, 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 the student teacher in, is, is responsible for conducting some preparation. One, one day before the, the observed lesson, there's a planning skills workshop overseen by the tutor. And then on the day of the lesson, there's a teaching skills workshop, which involves some of the teachers trying out or rehearsing some of the procedures and techniques they're going to use in the observed lesson. So there's some micro teaching. And then you have the lesson itself with the tutor observing and providing feedback. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's very much a flipped approach. And this came up um, a lot in interview, as, as might be expected. What all of the trainers said was, as a result of teaching online and doing their teacher training online, they were needing to adopt much more of a flipped approach than they had done in the past. Um, <clears throat> something that Richard says here is that he, he felt that a lot of trainers, initially at least, were resistant to flipped learning. And they, they tried to, what Richard says here, do hours of traditional input online which I actually thought was really not very helpful, Richard says. So, and this, this relates to the point Ray, I raised before about fatigue and about how it was very difficult for teachers to simply translate what they do in a, in a face-to-face -face classroom and then move that online. So, so doing lots of traditional input online was not especially helpful. It was exhausting. It's, it's very different from a physical classroom because you can't switch modes of input very easily. You can't use different techniques as easily. You can't, you can't uh, sustain energy levels very easily. So um, for Richard, uh, this flipped learning approach was very important. So he was asking his teachers to go and read about something, do some research. Then there would be a short demonstration lesson and, and it was much more focused on the needs of the student teacher, rather than providing um, sort of a priori a set of techniques and procedures. The what, what's also, I mean, you'll have, you'll have to excuse me. This is very raw data still. Okay, so what I've got is quite a, a, a series of slides with some fairly long extracts. The, the some of these interviews I are only. Um, a, a few days old, so I'm, I'm still state of that. I'm still very much collecting and, and analyzing and trying to understand. Okay, so as I say, it's very raw data still. The what? Um, so, but a, a common theme I found, and this is Richard again speaking, is that the, and this also relates to what Melissa Lamb says in the article about the flipped classroom. It's for Richard. It was all about. Uh, reducing the amount of input he was providing and get and engaging much more with the student teachers and seeing how they might learn by doing and for trying to facilitate this learn by doing approach rather than providing lots of uh, sort of theory and, and discussion of methods okay so and, and again we've got reference to the the flipped approach so and this is again this is Richard speaking in the same interview so you can't simply the point that Richard makes here is that you can't simply move everything that you do face to face into an online mode you can't ship you can't adopt the same practices you can't use the same material you can't use the same approach and then simply trans transfer that to an online environment it doesn't work you have to completely rethink it 
um, that your and this is partly to do with the technological challenges, partly to do with the different ways in which we interact through these these uh, on these platforms, but also because of attentional resources and, and what, what's required. Um, I mentioned orthodoxy before, and this is a really important part of what Richard talks about when um, describing how he's responded to the on to to, to the need to move to an online mode for initial teacher training. Um, the, what he found was that he had to change the way he thought about what was considered conventional wisdom or ortho, orthodox um, in, in terms of practice, okay? That, um, what, and here he mentions providing, uh, again, doing drilling and providing concept checking questions. The really important aspect of this, though, was that um, the, the, the these tutors had access to an online resource that uh, their student teachers could access, and, and uh, an online resource that that gave short demonstrations um, and descriptions of uh, key techniques and procedures and methodologies. Um, without which it would have been very, very difficult. And I think that's something that a lot of us have struggled with. It's, well, what, what resources do we use? What, 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 how can we facilitate our, our students to learn the kind of content that they need to learn when we're not there face to face with them in the classroom? Uh, and I, I think that's really, really important to, to highlight. The, and then if, I think this is the, the last slide from Richard. Yes, this is the, the really important. Then I think this was this was something um, really key to how Richard was talking about his experience was that he he described it as firefighting. I think possibly a lot of people there we go. A lot of people might be able to to relate to that. Um, the, in that you there wasn't an established pedagogy. That there wasn't an established set of uh, there wasn't an established set of principles, um, and there wasn't an established theory or framework that he was aware of that he could use in order to know how to adapt his materials, resources, and um, and approaches. That we need a new pedagogy. It's not enough to do the same thing as before. You can't simply trans and here he uses the word you can't simply transpose what we do face-to-face -face and what we've traditionally done face-to-face -face into an online environment, okay, it's not the same, okay, that a new pedagogy is required okay, if we want to know how to use digital technology effectively and if we want to help student teachers know how to learn, uh, know how to use digital technology effectively. The, the meeting, the interview with Re, um, really sort of shed light on very similar themes, but a, an important point that she made early on in, in my conversation with her was the need to think about the assessment criteria that are used in teacher education. And she said the first thing that happened once the lockdown in the UK took place in March 2020 was that the school management had to immediately look at the assessment criteria they were using from the syllabus guidelines um, and, uh, th th and assessment criteria to, to make sure that each of the criteria they, they had been using in face-to-face -face teacher training could also be met through online teaching practice. Um, and it was, it was determined that, yes, if you look at the criteria in the Cambridge CELTA syllabus guidelines, you can demonstrate those same criteria through online teaching. OK, um, but that was that's very much a management perspective. So that was the management of the school and Cambridge themselves, the the the, the organizer, the the, um, as the body that oversees the teaching award. Richard's perspective, Richard also talked about this is Richard. Now. He also talked about this and with another colleague um, saying how, well, not all of the assessment criteria can be applied in the same way that we're going to have to, the, the point being made was that 
surely we have to revise the syllabus guidelines that Cambridge need to revise the syllabus guidelines because we can't be sure that the existing criteria are fit for purpose any longer if we're going to continue with online teaching and online tutoring. And I think that's a really important point. Um, it does take time for these kinds of things to happen. The um, examination boards tend to be fairly slow moving, but um, clearly something does need to happen. It's, we don't want to, to, to make sure, we're, we don't want to change the practices to fit the criteria. We need to change the criteria that fit best practices. And that's something that, that needs to, to happen, I think, now in response to the, this move to more remote online teaching. The, in relation to the, the question of novice and experienced teachers, here you have Re talking about this difficulty. Um, as I, I mentioned this before in the summary of the key themes that have emerged, that for experienced teachers, she describes this as a, a double whammy. Yeah? That, that if you're an experienced teacher who is used to being competent and in control, yeah, you've got to demonstrate that they've suddenly not got the same control that they had before. So as an experienced teacher on a teacher education course, an in-service course, it's very difficult for them to demonstrate their expertise if they are struggling to take hold of new technological uh, challenges. And that can be, she was saying that can be quite disruptive when they're trying to deal with their professional development um, and also having to cope with new technologies. It's, it's, and this was a common, a common phrase that I heard um, often, that it was a steep learning curve. Demonstrating expertise was difficult. Um, the, I was very interested to learn about what these tutors were doing in their feedback sessions when commenting on observed teaching practice. Um, and what came out of this really was that in some respects, the tutors were needing to be quite directive with the technology. They were having to intervene sometimes and explain to teachers how the technology was going to work or, or what they needed to remember to do in order to manipulate the technology. For example, when giving instructions, setting up breakout rooms, visiting breakout rooms to monitor, all of these were quite challenging for both novice and experienced teachers who hadn't done online teaching before. So Re, as a tutor observing this, found that she needed to be quite directive, but she also found in other ways, she was being more indirect, more so less directive and, and adopting a more alternative based approach. So um, she was saying that during the, a lot of her feedback, she was focused on allowing trainees to explore and come up with alternatives themselves. And her, she felt that her role was just to, to listen to their conversation, their discussion, their recall of an observed lesson. And then if there was anything that they had that hadn't been covered in the teacher's discussion of the teaching practice that was related to assessment criteria, then she would again be directive. And I, th this came up a lot in the interview with Richard as well. The, the, there was a lot of, um, collaboration and sharing ideas. It was less, it overall tended to be less directive than in a, a conventional face-to-face -face teacher training course. The, something very interesting that Ree said um, is that there was much more emphasis on a discussion of the underlying principles of an activity because teachers might need to be doing an activity face to face and online, or they might not know whether or not they were going to need to teach online or face to face. So there was, she found that they, were, they needed to discuss the underlying principles in uh, more extensively in more depth, um, because you couldn't take anything for granted. Okay, they were having to adapt and blend both styles of, of learning and teaching. The very interestingly, there was also uh, quite a lot of discussion of uh, using, adapting, uh, designing and using materials online. Um, and something that we felt was that teachers involved in an online teacher training course 
as student teachers had what she describes as better materials awareness, that they became much more aware of, of how to, to design materials. And then I think this relates back to the point about underlying principles. If you think, if you, if the teachers are having to think more extensively and in more depth about the um, aims and objectives of, a, of some material and the principles underlying a particular technique or procedure, then that's going to give them better understanding long term. All right. But there was a very interesting moment um, as well, where Re in interview said, well, a lot of the, the she, she actually prefers online training now, especially because in face to face classrooms, you still have to wear a mask. Um, and that, that was something that that we both shared as an experience. And I think that this is so that this is the moment where she talks about this is our interview. This is the moment where she talks about um, face to face teaching, not being able to engage or interact with students because everyone's having to wear a mask. And I think this is what we're all we're all finding that we're, we're developing a whole new set of shared experiences as practitioners that we've not had before. And this is creating a very different way of thinking about um, your 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 membership of professional communities of practice. We, 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 we've got these very different shared experiences now than we had in the past. The, so again, Re comes back to flipped training. She mentions this. Um, and really the, a key point that she makes is that engagement through online teacher training sessions looks quite different than it used to. That, that it's, that it's um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of the input, it, there's a lot of reflection. I think this is a really good thing. This, she describes it as reflection heavy, which is an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, that there was uh, a lot of collaborative planning and the input was much more workshop oriented than it had been in the past. Rather than providing input in a more lecture based mode, it was much more, as I say, workshop and collaborative in nature. The, and interestingly here, the, the Zoom call for the interview was interrupted due to connection problems. So just a reminder of some of the technological challenges. The, and connected to this point about being collaborative, she mentions how in, in the teacher, in, in preparation for teaching, there was a lot of rehearsal through micro teaching where teachers were try, being experimental, trying out new techniques and procedures more than they would have done if the, the session had been face-to-face -face and more than they would have done if it had been much more tutor-fronted with, uh, with input being delivered in a more conventional sense. Okay, so, so the role of the tutor in relation to the student teacher has changed. Um, and there was quite a lot of talk about, um, again, about it not simply being a case of transferring everything to an online platform, that we can't use the same material in the same format and we can't use the same resources and procedures. We've got to design things differently and we've got to think about things differently. So just to um, summarise my, and I, I, all of these findings have been very, very interesting. As I say, it's still very, very raw data. I'm still making sense of this. There's still quite a lot of, of interview data for me to analyze. Um, what I'm planning to do is work together with one of the participants, Richard, to develop, to, to, to turn this into an article about um, engaging in uh, student teacher interaction through uh, online delivery. The, so it, my own practices have changed um, in that pre-COVID, and, and here I'm referring to two modules that I teach, on a, a master's degree in applied linguistics and English language teaching, a module in sociolinguistics and a module in teacher education. Um, and the, the research work that I talked about before, the goals that I talked about before in, in promoting uh, critical awareness of the impact of globalization on English and critical awareness of what this means for the way we think about uh, language competence and knowledge about language, that's, those are those are key aspects of both of these modules, the sociolinguistics module and the teacher education module. Before COVID, both of these modules were, were essentially taught through a two hour lecture, so a series of 10 
two hour lectures that were delivered face to face. For some of those lectures, there was an audio recording um, using lecture capture that would then have been uploaded to the virtual learning environment. Um, the two hour lecture would have been would have consisted of me talking through a slide presentation and maybe having some discussion of key reading. Post pandemic, this now looks very, very different. Um, so there's much more of a flipped approach. It's much less lecture fronted. So it, there's a, I now typically have a one hour pre-recorded lecture that is uploaded on Keats, that's the virtual learning environment at King's, a week before the timetabled session. There are also pre-lecture tasks and much more focused pre-readings than I had used before. There are asynchronous chats that are um, with via a discussion forum on the VLE and remote study group interaction. So all of the students are organized into small study groups of about five to six students. And they are, they are asked to set up and, 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 and they've been reporting back on this. They've, asked, they've been asked to set up their own um, Zoom calls or Teams meetings where they discuss the pre-lecture tasks and the pre-reading. Then after all of that, so this is why it's flipped, all of that happens before the face-to-face -face interaction. Then you have a one hour seminar, which was online until September, 2021 at King's since September, 2021. Um, and starting again next week, still we are teaching face-to-face, -face, but we are doing, we're having to do both. So a face-to-face -face one hour seminar followed by a one hour um, online seminar for students who are studying remotely. Uh, and this was principally using Zoom and trying as much as possible to make use of breakout rooms. So the, just to, to finish the key lessons that I've learned and key strategies that we need to take forward for the future, I think are that teaching cannot simply be moved online. At the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk amongst my colleagues um, in, and including from the management at King's uh, of moving teaching online. We can't do that. You can't just move teaching online, as I hope I've, I've, I've illustrated with the, the um, interview uh, data. Uh, we need to adapt everything that we do. We need to think differently about what we do. Digital technology in education is here to stay. I, I'm not an early adopter. It's taken me a long time to, 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 being, to, to be thinking about uh, teaching differently. Um, and, and of course, now I've had to do it, right? I think obviously it's here to stay. And I don't think any of us or many of us are going to go back to what was normal before, you know, the old normal. We're going to be using much more hybrid approach. Um, using digital technologies effectively requires very specific skills and a very specific uh, set of strategies the digital technology needs to be embedded through materials and activities. We can't simply have, like we used to have, a session on teacher education course, we used to have a session on or a small module on using digital technology. It needs to be far more embedded now through the kinds of materials and activities that we use in teacher education. The, this is a challenge. Um, students and teachers require access to devices, access to appropriate software, and they require digital support. This is not easy. This is very, very challenging. And there, it was mentioned this morning in, in, in several of the talks that there is um, not, we don't have equality of access to digital technologies. That's something that really needs to be, to be uh, an issue that we take forward. The um, framing of professional knowledge and expertise must include uh, technology, technology, technological pedagogic uh content knowledge it, it is essential yeah we, we can't we, we need to this needs to become part of the way we frame expertise uh this is and this is from very recent phd thesis that uh was uh examined in in november 2021 student of mine at king's uh, who did his phd thesis on uh teachers awareness and teachers use of um digital technologies and what he concluded this is from his concluding chapter that teachers who have a solid TPAC who have been given specific training in in order to develop uh, digital technological 
content, pedagogic and content knowledge. You, they're used, they, they use their knowledge um, in order to make assertive decisions about what type of technology to use in specific teaching contexts with a clear intention to maximize students' learning. So it has to become part of the way we think about expertise, professional expertise uh, and the knowledge base of, uh, of teachers. It's essential that we do that. Um, and I think all of us have learned how important this is over the past two years. I'm, I'm going to stop there. Hopefully I haven't overrun too much. Oh my gosh, I haven't overrun. Haven't I? Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's a, it's a new topic for me to talk about. Yes, yes. sorry. That's why it's yeah. taken me longer. <laughs> That's okay. It's good to have this kind of feeling motivation to do new research, new... Well, it's, yeah, yeah, I found it very challenging, but very, very stimulating. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Martin. This was really an inspirational talk. Um, I haven't got many questions on the chat box, but I have some comments. Uh, okay. Maybe you would like to hear. Uh, please, and please, if, yeah. if there's any questions, they can always post it and we can forward you uh, and we can talk uh, at the end of the session. Okay, the one, okay, now it says, okay, uh, I think, I think during, in the beginning of your talk, uh, Jale Sarıca, uh, one of the teachers, she's also one of the teachers in our project. Um, I think the essential point is deciding the appropriate activity for appropriate group. Even my adult learners feel more, more confident and willing to participate in the conversation during the lesson. They like the games and traditional grammar exercises when I serve them on online uh, platform. So she actually works uh, from a distance and uh, she works with adults. Okay, yeah. 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 And who are developing their uh, spoken uh, skills actually. Okay, so, so, so the point that she's making here is that it can be, so working remotely like this can be an advantage for learners who might be otherwise nervous in a face-to-face -face classroom yeah. who might be nervous about sharing ideas and, and communicating yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's a, a, that can be too yeah I think um I mean something I've found is that there are um during breakout rooms particularly there are students who are quite happy to interact and volunteer students who who feel less confident I think will often use the chat function. So yeah. they're able to participate more than they would in a face-to-face -face class. In a face-to-face -face class, they might be simply silent. Um, so I think more of, the, more of the students are able to become involved, especially if they feel fairly, fairly nervous about, about um, participating actively. So yeah, I think that's an important point. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also agree with you, and it's sometimes better to have this uh, screen between us for them to do yeah. something and sometimes it can be a problem some people do, do like it some people don't but yeah. as you said yeah. also we might need to adapt a hybrid approach from now on I think uh, I think yeah. probably we're going I think probably we're all going to adopt a more hybrid approach I don't yeah. I don't imagine us returning to yeah. not not using digital yeah. technology as much you know of just being in the classroom yeah, I mean, I mean, several of several of the teachers I spoke to said that they they were actively making much more use of the internet during face to face classes now than they were before. Yeah, that, yeah. that it was it, it it had shown them the value of being able to share something online with somebody while interacting with them. That um, what she said she was doing a lot in in observation was. During the observed teaching practice, she was able to post comments, but also links to key readings or, or useful resources, uh, websites designed for uh, learning resources. Um, and that she was now also doing that face to face. So she would pause the session face to face, go to the because every every classroom has a has internet access now anyway, and she would just sort of posting comments on uh, on the screen while the students were interacting in, or engaged in a, in a task. So she was bringing that technology into the face-to-face -face classroom more than she was before as well. Yeah. yeah, that was actually the starting point of our project. Mm. Uh, Dennis has been nagging us since 2000, 
11 actually, the first time we met uh, during the conference uh, about the, exactly, you know, you cannot, they don't have the luxury not to use uh, technology anymore. Mm -hmm. None of us have mm -hmm. that luxury. If we yeah. want to main, you know, stay in this uh, business of teaching, yeah. lecturing and so on. So another one uh, from Shebnam, thank you for this inspirational talk, Martin. Great, great listening to you. Another um, participant, Mustafa Emre, he also thanks you and, uh, and many other uh, pre uh, people thank you for this interesting talk. They say no, no questions. Okay. okay. Thank, well, th thank you for inviting me to give the thank talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very so, much. It's been again for accepting.